Hello and welcome to the ZWorks CNBC TV18 Smart Manufacturing Summit. Our focus today on India's defense production and the role of private sector in boosting indigenization. Remember, Atma Nirbharta or self-reliance in defense production has been a key theme for governments over the years. We want to increase our defense manufacturing footprint from a GDP point of view, from a social uh, point of view, and also from a security perspective. But there is an export angle to it as well. And for the last few years, we have been trying to boost our defense exports as well. So we've got a stellar panel with us over here to discuss where we are with our Atmanir Bharta journey and what role can private sector, big companies, foreign OEMs, and MSMEs play in this journey. Let me introduce, uh, we have Shekhar Shivrasta, former Managing Director of HAL. Thank you very much for joining Hello. us, sir. We've got Vishal Chaudhary, co-founder of Zetwork. Uh, Ashwini Bhargav, the Senior Director and Head for Supply Chain Management at Boeing India. And Colonel Danveer Singh, uh, somebody who has served in the Indian Army till about 2012. He has been a trial officer for many of the weapon systems and it will be very interesting to hear his uh, practitioner's perspective. And let me actually kick it off uh, with Colonel Danveer Singh. We were speaking about uh, where we are with our Atmanir Bharta journey a short while back. Uh, what are some of the challenges that you had seen as a practitioner while serving in the force? And to what extent have we been able to eliminate those challenges that the armed forces were facing? Uh, uh, firstly, uh, very thank you to have invited me here. And it's so nice talking to you on this important subject that uh, impacts national security. As a user, uh, I'll cover that first. As a user, I have realized that uh, uh, we have a regime of uh, protectionism. And that is uh, very much in place even till date. So when we have to protect our systems, uh, we situate uh, the uh, reports uh, to facilitate that protectionism. Uh, that, that is something that I found when I was carrying out trials of INSAS. Uh, whatever we had recommended as trial officers uh, and the trial team, uh, they were um, made, we were made to change that subsequently because it had to situate, it had to favorably, favorably uh, you know, favor the, uh, the industry, the, the defense industry. And I think uh, this kind of uh, uh, attitude by the, uh, by the system has not actually helped uh, the nation. Now, when we talk of as to how we can be at the lead, at the end of it. We have to get away from this uh, protectionism. We have to uh, develop an ecosystem with fair play. So all these things, uh, as of now, are lacking. So we'll talk as we uh, move forward. Right. Uh, Mr. Shivastav, I'd like to ask you, uh, because who better to speak about uh, indigenization and our weapon system program and our defense ambitions, then our former managing director of HL, someone who's seen this journey very closely. Do you agree with Colonel Danveer of, on some of these roadblocks that we face on different parts of the government not being able to work together? Uh, that, I'm sure, is very critical for the journey towards self-reliance. Thank you very much. Thank you, CNBC and Jetwork, for inviting me for this particular summit. Partially, I agree with Colonel but not fully. What I have seen is that the parameters and the specifications which are drafted by the services are usually not moldable and not changeable per se, unless there is a serious need. We being there into aerospace industry, I would just give an example of the Tejas aircraft. It has taken quite a lot of time to come up to this stage, but there was never an agreement or a deviation from the originally drafted parameters for the aircraft program. Although it has taken quite a lot of change from there because the new developments have come up in the world and the systems have changed and the requirements have come up to that stage. But it is not because of the deviations from the originally drafted parameters or the requirement, what we call as a QR or the DSR. The uh, requirement given by the services department. But there are hurdles. There are hurdles. There are hurdles in the sense that there are requirements which are certainly sometimes not within the capability of the manufacturing industry. 
they have to develop those processes they have to come up to that standard to meet that requirement let me give an example that there is a steel coating on to required onto the dome it's not easily available but it has to be developed and it has to be applied onto the dome so it would take time but there is no compromise there is no deviation from that parameter so i partially agree with colonel that sometimes it is there but not majority of the cases it is not not done right and hopefully we as uh, governments private sector public sector will work more closely together in future to eradicate those uh, barriers uh, mr bhargav if i would uh, get you in at this stage uh, mr bhargav is someone actually who has been uh, looking after supply chains at boeing in india for the last 7 years or so i'd like to ask you how how are you seeing india's defense ecosystem is there a is there a big shift in the way the private sector has been able to operate in the defense sector or you feel that there are barriers still there is a mindset barrier and there are some uh, uh, other barriers also nothing happens unless you counter the challenges so first the ecosystem and that's where the private sectors come into picture historically when we talked about ecosystem we thought about hal and we had to think about them because they were the pioneers but over a period of time a number of private sectors like tatas mahindras wipros have come into play in addition there are multiple msmes that have come into play and by the way we have 300 suppliers in our ecosystem 26% of those are msmes so significant play by msmes the intent to invest is higher with the private sector and remember the people or the suppliers who are working with us have to compete the global level and it is not a question of offset or labor arbitrage thereafter so you have to focus on technology uh, which is where the private sectors come in ability to innovate you know the times are gone when people say come to india for labor so you have to innovate you have to invest you have to have the skill developed with the workforce and at the supervisory level all this has come a long way with the private sector and i'm happy to share that about 80% of uh, the growth that we have seen is in the private sector right zetwork is a company which is into various manufacturing sectors you had acquired pinaka a defense and aerospace company as well uh, give us a sense of the programs of the government that uh, you are interested in you are benefiting from and uh, the kind of contracts you'd like to explore for the, for the future i think uh, over the last few years the policy tailwinds have been very very strong in this industry in overall in aerospace and defense and the consequence of that is we see a lot of new age companies working today with the isros and the drdos and the hals which is all a very positive sign uh some of the policies some of these policies one has been uh, you know a massive push for indigenization and that motion we actually see on the ground today a uh, lot of uh, and this bridge for indigenization is largely being plugged in by by a lot of private companies who have got the opportunity to participate in them the other major uh, push that we see uh, a positive push that we see is today the indian suppliers are getting elevated from just being a component supplier to a solutions provider and the moment you become a solutions provider you sort of have the complete custody uh, end to end custody and like like somebody mentioned the resilience and reliability is of utmost important when it comes to sectors like aerospace and defense so some of these pushes have have uh, have been really good for the private industry and uh, we pinaka uh, as one of the companies has been a beneficiary of it right uh, and when we speak about r&d uh, that's extremely important uh, in a defense ecosystem and government is the sole buyer for defense systems do you feel that at a government level from a financial point of view enough attention is being paid to r&d in the defense sector and also handhold startups like yours uh i think yes uh, some of the new programs and the new acquisition systems and policies that have come in place where the government is encouraging and to some extent also helping out private industry to invest in this kind of an r&d which in long term plays out in uh, creating complete custody of the end to end solution within the country uh, to prepare us for any eventuality right uh mr shivastav just to ask you about uh, the tejas example recently the air force got clearance to procure 180 lca mark 1 aircraft from uh, hal so that is going to be a big achievement uh, in terms of our indigenization road map but what are the learnings from the tejas journey from your decades at hal 
uh, on what we need to do in terms of Atmanavita and also the role of the private sector there. Considering the government is the sole buyer, yes, we're trying to create markets globally. We're trying to uh, market the Tejas to countries like Argentina, uh, Malaysia. We are trying to take it abroad, but there are challenges. How much can you push the private sector to invest when there will always be a bit of uncertainty uh, in terms of what the future has in store? A very good question. Let me, before answering that question, let me put some nuances to the defense supplies. The first one is that a very apt quoting by somebody said that defense supplies cannot be looked at a business of only profit. Sometimes the pride is also involved. So a lot of people, they understand that the defense supplies usually will not give them the same amount of profit which they would be expecting from the other business. That is one. Second is that, as Colonel was saying, that there is a lot of protectionism. Earlier days, government was saying that because of the sensitive technology, these have to be only limited to the PSUs and the government organizations like Ordnance Factory. But with the recent development where the private sector has come up and shown their capabilities into the advanced technology, and also to provide end-to-end -end solution, as Vishal was saying, the government has opened up. There is an acceptance at the customer level. There is an acceptance at the government level that we should involve more and more private sector. Now, coming to the Tejas program, the le lesson what we have learned is that if we really want to have a very agile program where we can do the changes very quickly and meet the expectations of the customer, we need to have involvement of a private sector more and more. So today, fortunately, with the effort, joint effort with, uh, with a, within the private sector and uh, government sector, which is PSU, we have a large percentage of the LRUs and the systems indigenized. And we expect that it will go to the expected level of 60 to 70 percent very quickly. So the lesson what we have learned is that we need to have the private sector as a partner and sometimes as a risk sharing partner, which will benefit both of them. Because then it gets into the commitment mode. The limitation with the aerospace sector is that it is not only the production and the stock. It also requires a long-term support. Sometimes that puts a lot of pressure onto the private sector. Nobody would like to block his space for, let's say, a 70-year program like Jaguar, which is running, is still running there. And you have to have the jigs, you have to have the system in place to keep on repairing and supplying it back. So there's a risk which private industry has to understand and step into the defense supply program. Some very interesting insights from Mr. Srivastava. But if we speak about a global example, when we speak about compare uh, defense budgets, what is the kind of incentive, what is the kind of R&D uh, support that is coming in from the US government, for example, other governments, other jurisdictions that you uh, work in, and examples that we could take in India? Yep. So I think it's, it's more of a partnership you know, at the global level. And you have to understand, you know, at India level, as Shekhar also said, we don't have that level of scale. But when you fast forward and go to the global level, then you have the scale and that closes the business case uh, you know, very closely. So I think it's more of a partnership between the government and the OEMs like us, which makes it a little different. Yeah. Right. Uh, Colonel Darvi, I'd, I'd like to ask you about areas of opportunities for startups and the private sector. Uh, as someone who is very familiar with the challenges that we faced, with Pakistan, with China, also the new age warfare challenges that we have. What are some of the opportunities that you see for the private sector for the future? We, we heard of some very important examples in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the air defense sector by Mr. Shivastav. Anything that you could tell us from a perspective of the Indian Army? See, as we are discussing, uh, one thing emerges, and uh, not only here, wherever the discussion uh, takes place. Uh, make in India, India is doing well. Make in India is basically uh, you are bringing in things and assembling in India. So we are doing fantastically well. Uh, when we talk of Atmanirbar, uh, I think we are uh, doing very, very poorly in that. Atmanirbar means that you master critical technologies, you 
innovate and create critical technologies that we have not been able to do. We have developed a missile, say, example. We have developed a missile, but we don't have the seeker. The seeker would be, say, just 1% of the missile. But that 1% makes that missile redundant. So nobody will give you that technology. You have to develop that technology. And to develop that technology, you have to have an ecosystem in place. Do you have scientists coming up in that particular specific field trained by your IITs? Answer is no. In fact, I was just reading uh, that only IIT Kanpur offers course on naval technology. And when we talk of uh, Atmanirbharta, uh, Army, Navy, and Air Force, Navy is miles ahead. It is because of this reason, as per whatever report I was reading. It says that it is because of this reason. Today, the Kaveri engine is struggling because we cannot develop that turbofan. To develop that turbofan, we require a kind of a metallurgy that nobody is willing to give you. So you asked a question that, can we become Boeing and Safran and MBDA and extra extra? Answer is no. We cannot. We are nowhere near because our ecosystem is not there in place. In our engineering colleges across the country, it's time to have maybe a greater focus on defense engineering. When it comes to the education system, for example, in Germany, there is a big focus on automotive engineering and engineering in general. Do you think a focused course on defense engineering will help us develop those skill sets for the future? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Do you feel that's missing? As that, an engineer yourself? Uh, uh, in the yeah, I would say there's more that we can do there, for sure. And uh, on R&D, it's not just about aerospace and defense. In general, R&D spends in our country has been below uh, what it should have been. But I, I'd say that things are changing now. There are more and more people who are uh, investing in R&D and developing technologies in the country. And I think these are all signs of good change of uh, things to come. Right. Uh, Mr. Bhargav, coming back to you, as Boeing powers itself in the Indian ecosystem. Uh, give us a sense of how you are looking to deepen your supply chain at an MSME level, and if there are certain impediments to your growth in India, some critical gaps, what would those be? Yeah. <clears throat> so, I, you know, as I said, uh, we are at a billion dollar uh, uh, every year from India. That's a sourcing number that we have. And that is about 2% of the global buy that we have. So it's a very small number. And uh, as you rightly said, you know, and Colonel also said, uh, the key to Atmanirbhar is to develop the full ecosystem. And today we are very, uh, you know, we are prominent in very select areas, structures or some part of electrical work. So we have to, you know, if we have to be Atmanirbhar, we have to have a broader ecosystem in place. And that is where MSMEs also come into picture. So just to give you the number, 26% of our supply base is MSME. And they play a, a major role. In fact, uh, you know, we uh, recognize uh, 10 suppliers across the globe every year. And I'm proud to tell you that, uh, you know, in a couple of years, uh, one of the MSMEs have been the winner. So they're performing at the global stage. Now, where do they come into picture? Now, Tata's and Mahindra's and uh, Wipro's will not be competitive in all kind of products. So you've got to have smaller suppliers in the mix who can provide that level of focus, attention, and the competitiveness. Second, certain activities are non-core to some of the big players. Secondary processes, for example, they are better performed by the MSMEs. A lot of innovation, and you know, you'll be surprised to see, uh, you know, how competent the MSMEs are. Uh, innovation happens in MSMEs most of the time, so I think they're an integral part of the supply chain, and they will be. And as far as Boeing is concerned, we have all the intent to grow beyond a billion dollar. Uh, we have to cut across the full value chain. We are doing structures, we are doing uh, harnesses, we are getting into thermoplastics, we are getting into forgings, systems, you know, everything that gets on the plane. So we got to have the right mix of the big players and MSMEs. Right. Uh, Vishal, just to speak about where Z-Work can come in in terms of forging partnerships with some of the large global players like Boeing and our existing defense PSUs, which have been meeting the needs of the Indian Armed Forces for decades now, uh, how do you think uh, a company like Zetwork can contribute to the Atmanirbharta journey with PSU players like HAL, with the likes of Boeing and other defense companies globally? A company like Zetwork or any new age company is uh, by DNA very agile and uh, more open 
to uh, innovation, I would say. And uh, today we partner with a lot of uh, partners in, the, in Europe and in the US and uh, try to become an effective partner to them to service the Indian market. Uh, if you see with the defense forces in India and with the DPSUs in India, our inbound has grown almost four times over the last two years than what it was for, uh, for a decade uh, before that. So there's a lot of openness from the customer side as well as uh, from the supplier side to uh, ensure reliability, to customize solutions. Uh, we have a good team of operators and engineers, right? people who use the technology and people who develop the technology, which gives the right solution, which is uh, most apt uh, for the eventual use. Right. We'll now take final set of questions, uh, and we'll, all, uh, we'll ask all our panelists about one key theme or one key viewpoint that they'd like to leave us with to think about in terms of the role of the private sector in indigenization. Mr. Srivastava, I'd like to begin with you. Uh, finally, what would be your recommendation for the private sector and to the government for harnessing what the private sector can bring to the table in terms of defense manufacturing for the future? As I said uh, in the beginning, that the private sector has to come up with the idea that the defense supply business is not purely on profit basis. It has to be have a pride associated with it. Secondly, the government still needs to do a lot of changes into the procedures and the policies which are right now also hampering the production, hampering the progress of the pri private sector participated participation into this. So the procedures are something like that. Uh, there are certification process. There are approvals which are required, and there are testing. Let me give an example of the aerospace business. When you have to certify a product into the aerospace business, you just can't simply put it somewhere and then test it. You have to fly it on an aircraft, which has got so many systems coordinating with it, and then it is going on there. And putting it on an aircraft is not an easy job. To put a small LRU of, let's say, whatever value it is, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time, a lot of preparation, and a lot of money goes into that. So the private sectors would not be able to afford unless there is a support from the government and the DPSUs. So we need to have these two sec particular entities open up and provide support to the private sector. Right. Uh, Mr. Bhargav, does that mean that our defense budgets need to significantly go up? Because uh, it's not just about meeting immediate operational needs of the Army, Air Force, and the Navy. You have to think long term. You have to think about handholding the private sector. Uh, so it will need more investment. What do you feel? Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, I'll just go beyond the defense part of it. If you look at aerospace and defense, between the India requirement and the global requirement, the demand is pretty high. So the question is, where do we find the right suppliers? I think this is the opportunity for all of us in India to make an impact, not just at the India level, but also at the global level. And that will mean that we invest in new technologies in areas that we have not been doing historically in India, uh, and that will require investment. So I would say, you know, in terms of the government support and the, what you're talking about, there has to be investment, there has to be a higher level of investment. That will also help us close the business case to pursue multiple things that we have not been doing in the past. Right. Uh, Colonel Dalveer, final thoughts. I personally feel that uh, if we have to break the ceiling, uh, apart from uh, creating ecosystem, we also require to bring in synergy. And to do that, we need an uh, umbrella organization like the US and the, the French uh, organization. Uh, th this I'm saying because uh, like uh, during the lunch, I was talking to uh, the people from the industry. Uh, and uh, it emerged that there is a lot of reluctance between the, uh, uh, the interaction between the user and the, uh, the private uh, player. Now that uh, reluctance is because of various reasons. We all are aware of uh, what are the reasons. So something is needed to obviate that. Those hurdles have to be cleared. And a synergy is to be brought in. And to bring in that kind of a synergy, we require uh, something like uh, DARPA of uh, the US or DSA of uh, the France. And that is very much uh, the need of the R. If we really want to go aggressive on Atmanirbhar, uh, make in India, I'm not talking about. Right. Uh, Michelle, any final thoughts that you'd like to leave us with when it comes to defense manufacturing? How important is this for uh, Zetwork's entire network of businesses? 
It's very important. And uh, like Sir rightly mentioned that uh, beyond uh, profits, we also take a lot of pride being associated with the forces and the DPSUs. Uh, the, I mean, some of these DPSUs should look at uh, private companies as an extension of capabilities, as an extension of uh, 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 the capacities. And I believe that uh, with the right partnership, this industry is bound to gallop. And the policy tailwinds are very, very strong today. Right, policy tailwinds are strong. Clearly, there is a push towards self uh, for indigenization, but a lot more, as all our panelists have been saying, a lot more needs to be done in terms of government spending, uh, easing of policies for the private sector to engage with the uh, PSUs and our forces in a big way. Thank you very much for watching, and goodbye.